didn't have much money in my bank account. I put everything I had into the business. I wasn't taking a salary. And it took two years and eventually it just came to this. Hi, I'm Craig from Risk Enthusiast and I'm here in Cleveland at Teddy Baldassar's new store, which just opened, I think, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Feels longer, but two weeks ago. How's it going? It is going well. It's going well. I think the reception's been phenomenal. And it's been cool, too, because you post things online. You have interactions in some way. But then when you're able to actually see somebody, show them a really cool watch, and then watch their reaction when they put it on the wrist for the first time, it's weird to say that I've never really experienced that yeah. really before. So to be able to have a space that we can do that, it's been phenomenal. And how often have you been in the store? I try to come in you know, here and there, I mean, especially now since we're just trying to figure out and learn and how we balance out the experience and make sure everybody has a you know, good time when they're in here, but probably only a few times. I mean, I can't be here every day, but it's also important for me that yeah. people, when they come here, they can have you know, a great time. I mean, it has your name on, on It does, on the it door, does, so. yeah, yeah, which is and, surreal. And I assume a lot of people are asking where you are when they, when they come in. Yes, I mean, for us, we want to keep making sure that we can you know, be here every day or people can come in and have this great experience. We have a phenomenal team, John, Will, AJ, people that are watch guys. If you have a question, they'll be able to answer it from that point of view. But also what we want to do is make sure we have like event schedules and things like that. And I, I want to show face here as much as I can. Yeah. And you know, just looking around, it's, it's really beautiful. And I think we're going to do a tour of, yes. of the store. So we'll get into that. But I wanted to go back a little bit and ask you kind of about your journey. Mm -hmm. You know, you started off on YouTube, I think, just, you know, posting videos from your home. And, you know, a few years later, you did an online, you opened up an online authorized retailer. And, and now you're opening up a brick and mortar store. How did that journey go? And did you always know that this was the direction you wanted to go into? First, to answer your question at the end, no. I mean, if you look at the first video, it was somebody that had no expectations. And that yeah. is 100 percent honesty. I remember, the only thing I remember when I hit the first you know, the record button for yeah. the first time was hitting the record button. Everything else, I almost blacked out. But <laughs> I was so passionate about watches at the time. I mean, I'm here in Cleveland, so Cleveland yeah. is not a place that I would call the mecca of watchmaking by any means. So I felt a little bit as an outcast yeah. in liking this stuff. Yeah. So I wanted to just post something and throw it out there. And the first video was just of my watch collection. I didn't know if anyone was going to watch it. I didn't tell my, tell my friends. I didn't tell my family. But it was something I was passionate about, I was interested in, so I threw it up and didn't look at it for a while. But yeah. then after you know, a month or so, it started to get some views. And more and more views, more and more views, and I'm like, wait, there's something here. Now, I saw comments, I saw people engaging, you know, people were saying encouraging things, and maybe some not as encouraging, <laughs> but that's part of the, the whole fun yeah. of it. I remember and, my first video, which was a lot more recent on the YouTube front. Someone, mm -hmm. I think, told me I was dead between the eyes or something like that. I was, you know, calling my wrists, like, small, and people were like, oh, you shouldn't be doing it, like, feminine, I was just all, all craziness. But I learned a lot, and I had fun with it. And what I did was I saw that there was something here, and I just kept posting and posting and posting. It got to a point, though, where when you are starting to do this, and I took the plunge to go full time on YouTube, and it, yeah. it's hard to produce content yeah. in, you know, on YouTube in a niche space like watches yeah. and make a living. Yeah. Like, it's tough, especially if you want to scale things, yeah. which I wanted to do. I wanted to post more content. I wanted to do cooler productions. And to do that, you need money. Yeah. So it was then figuring out how could we monetize appropriately so I could keep doing what I wanted yeah. to do. So there's questions of, hey, do we go the advertorial route where we take money from brands and do yeah. that? I saw what happened when a lot of other outlets do that. And I also came from a digital marketing background. Yeah. And I saw what could happen if you just did that with all industries. Yeah. So to think about doing a, making a business that is just focused on one industry yeah. and selling it, and then also trying to keep my voice, which was the most important thing. I didn't want to be dictated on what I could say, what I couldn't say. I had to really think about it. And then my partner, you know, Mike, we were talking one day. This was probably in 2019. And we threw out this concept of authorized, authorized dealership. Yeah. And at the time, you know, I had some context of what that meant, but I, I knew it was a ludicrous idea to think about. Yeah. But we were just crazy enough to ask. And we asked, a lot of no's, a whole lot of no's, follow-ups, asking, asking, asking. And in 2020, we eventually had a small subset of brands. And we launched teddyballister.com. Yeah. This was a point where I didn't have much money in my bank account. I put everything I had into the business. I wasn't taking a salary. I just invested everything in this website. I mean, you know, it was a six-figure investment, and that was really terrifying. And then COVID happens in March of 2020. <laughs> you know, so I am really scared. And this is right in the middle of the launch of the store. 
I'm posting content and you know, I'm, I'm traveling still. I'm trying to do everything I can to make this work. And then in June 2020, we launched the site. Yeah. Thankfully, it was a great success. Yeah. Uh, everything worked out and you know, I've been able to you know, continue to invest back into the content. And in the past you know, couple of years, what became very clear to me was this is an industry that is very much around the brick and mortar environment, a very yeah. important aspect. To be able yeah. to handle the product, especially over a certain price point, it's a part of the formula. If you look at especially the higher end brands, I mean, this is how you, you know, are able to sell yeah. this product and you know, how you're also able to create a community that I wanted. I wanted a place where when I, we were talking about this at the beginning, I never had that interaction yeah. where I could see somebody in the flesh yeah. and show them a watch. And that was pretty cool to me. I didn't know what all that would entail, but we started to really move forward on that process of brick and mortar. Yeah. And it took two years and eventually it just came to this. So and the construction of this was six months in, you know, in the making. We had you know, drawings, permits to get, to all, the, all the brands and what brands are in here were all in here with very specific purpose. I mean, mm -hmm. these are brands that I love. I think they also represent me. And I think they're brands that a lot of people that also yeah. watch that our content can also align with. So that was important and it was just a long journey, but to just to answer your question, I mean, how this all happened, I think it happened with just a chance. It happened with somebody that liked the subject matter and just was taking it one day at a time to just keep trying to do that as long as they possibly could. Yeah, and looking around the store, you talked a little bit about this, but these brands are kind of a step up at least you know, price-wise from what you've been selling on the website is, it seems like that is intentional. And why did you go about it? Like, I know that when I'm spending money on a really expensive watch, I want to try it on before I look at it. So is that one of the reasons why you did this? Because someone could then go into another store, try on an Omega and buy it from them. There's a variety of reasons. When you're trying to make a store successful too, in a brick and mortar environment versus e-commerce, it's a, it's a different approach you have to have yeah. in general. We're here in Cleveland. That was yeah. also a consideration. That's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And I also was looking at, okay, what is the mix of brands that also could resonate within this market that's being underserved? I mean, this market is very underserved. There's a lot of just the Midwestern and middle states of America yeah. that you see what happens with many of the brands. It's just the coast. Yeah. And they forget about all the rest yes. when it comes to like this retail experience. So part of it was, where can we find a unique brand mix that could work in a market? The other aspect is you want brands that represent you know, what you have here and you know, it can be a cool draw and you know, also represent our brand and what we've done so far with e-commerce. Uh, but also, you, know, you, you do want to just continue to just expand your offering too. You, mm -hmm. you do want to have a brand mix that is representative of what we are because just because we have certain models on our website, I like to cover the entire industry. Yeah. I go from Casio to FP Journe. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of my approach because I can find joy in all of those different watches. And I genuinely mean that. And I also have you know, spoken to many enthusiasts where they start one place, but we know how this yeah, goes, yeah. right? I mean, we, it's, it's a dangerous game yeah. where you just keep collecting and collecting and collecting and you just, one day you're thinking, oh, $500 for a, you know, a Hamilton. I can't, I, I can't, this is crazy. And then yeah. the next day you're buying a Rolex or an yeah. Omega. I mean, like, this is the type of stuff that happens. So yeah. it was all of those considerations at once where you're thinking about the local, you're thinking about uh, you know, what you want your brand to be you know, on a national level and you know, what experience you wanted to have in the store environment. It was all those things. And the other thing also that I'll mention is we also wanted this store to be an extension of what we were already doing mm -hmm. too. So like, the space to my left, I mean, this is you know, a space we call our Teddy space where yeah. we have our warehouse down the street. If you ever want to see anything beyond these pillar brands, mm -hmm. uh, that is something we can always just pull in here, have an appointment setting, and that's also important. One other thing I'll also mention is when developing a store, there's another thing that brands care about, which is co-tenancy. Yeah. And if you're going to have one brand, so say you want an Omega, you have to think about what other brands do they feel comfortable with. They want to create a luxury presentation no matter what. Yeah. So you have to make sure that you are thinking about the end customer, you're thinking about yourself, but you're also thinking about the brands and creating great image for everybody. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to my next question is, I know that you know, when I'm in a new city, whether it's internationally mm -hmm. or in the US, the first thing I really do when I get to that city is look up who the like, authorized dealer is. I do that too. <laughs> and I, I thought you might, and, and walk around and, you know, like just because most of my friends aren't necessarily watch people, so I can talk to you know, the people that work there who are watch people, but also just to kind of get a feel for what they offer and, mm -hmm. and all that entails. And I've seen like your videos with Kevin O'Leary where you're doing like shopping and you know, another New York City retailer. Mm -hmm. I won't name the name because obviously. Um, but how did your visits to these retailers shape what you wanted Teddy Baldessar's, the Teddy store to look like? What did you like and not like? One is, I, I think there's a lot of 
great retail locations in the United States. And I'll mention it, Booker, Watch the Switzerland. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. I, I have no, <laughs> no issue with any other retailers because I think this industry in general, it's good if we all succeed. The thing I learned the most, though, is I, I want people to feel welcome. You know, the same approach that I have online is I am just a guy yeah. who's talking about something I'm passionate about. So I want to make sure our retail environment can also really mirror that same idea. So that was the biggest thing for me. I don't want to have an environment where somebody comes in, I want to buy a watch. We don't have that watch. You can't do it. That, that yeah. whole scenario, I don't want to have that talk track. I also don't want someone to feel as much as you know, we like to you know, dress up, have a you know, luxury presentation. I don't want anybody to feel intimidated. I mean, you're going to come in the store. I want them to be greeted with a smile, yeah. uh, whether they're buying or not. I mean, we understand people might just want a window shop. That's okay. I mean, we're going to try to serve everybody equally and do the best that we can. Obviously, bandwidth sometimes it's a little bit yeah, you know, yeah. it's difficult, but we really do want to create an environment where everybody's welcome. And I think that's the number one thing. And to think about the brand mix where we're, I'm, an enth I'm an enthusiast first. I'm an enthusiast first, and the brands in here, I think, are enthusiast brands. So that was where I think we were also thinking, uh, you know, really pondering, like, how could we be a little bit different is even the brands in here. Like, is it Glassuto Riganel? Is that a brand that every yeah. retailer would pick yeah. up? Probably not. And there's reasons why and why not you wouldn't do, need to do that. But for us, it made perfect sense because I see this as one of the great gems in watchmaking from a value standpoint, from an artisanal watchmaking approach. But that's, I think, what makes us a little bit different too is because we can also resonate with different brands and with people that walk in on a wavelength that probably a lot of other traditional retailers maybe can't. At least that's what I hope. And what about the other brands? I see you have Breitling mm -hmm. and Grand Seiko and Omega. What was your thought process between those three other brands? All of these are brands that I like, I collect, and they gel well together. I love the story of you have Switzerland in the front, Japan also in the front, Germany, and then you have Omega. I mean, these, yeah. like, this was my first luxury brand I ever owned. Grand Seiko, I have so much admiration for, just Japanese craftsmanship. Whether we're talking about watches or beyond that, I collect selvage denim, and so like, I like that whole aspect of you know, what Japan does. They're just the peak of just doing things to a new level. Breitling, the icons that this brand has, remarkable, and I think they're just an incredible draw for somebody coming in. The amount of people we have that come by this store and mm -hmm. to see Breitling, like, Breitling, get very excited, yeah. surpass my expectations. So that, I mean, that was another reason, and then I mentioned with you know, Geo, it's just a cool story to tell. And like you have the city of Glasuta, which I've been fortunate enough to visit, where you see there is like you know, 5,000 people that live here. It's a resilient place. You know, this place was you know, taken over and like, you know, all the World War II, just all the drama there. But they remain this manufacturing powerhouse where there's only around 12 brands in that region. And they're still doing the majority of their work there. I mean, 95% of the components and those watches are produced in Glasuta, this small little region, two restaurants, two traffic lights. I mean, this is, there's yeah. nothing going on, but this is the mecca of watchmaking for Germany. So it, it was just trying to figure out how they could work together and just create an environment where they can kind of feed off of each other. But also, are they a reflection of you and what you're all about? That, that was kind of the goal. Yeah, and looking at the store, you can, I, you've taken this store within a store concept, mm -hmm. which I think is becoming much bigger in the, in the watch industry. You, if you look at Breitling, there's this really cool brick wall, yes. and then you know, Grand Seiko has like it's almost like their dials, like with the pattern. Yes. And but it's a lot more kind of like you know minimalist. Mm -hmm. And then obviously Omega behind us has that red and and the wood. How do you take this store within store concept? Because I'm sure the brands are very particular about what they want, but also keep kind of your Teddy spin on it at the same time. So each brand, when you get a space like this, how it typically goes is you approach the brands with the space that you want and you just kind of pitch them on, hey, this is our concept. And then once they express interest, you're then figuring out how much space you know, each brand yeah. will get. You're working back and forth. And then from there, you develop a design. One thing that I wanted to do with this store is I wanted each brand to be their own distinct idea while also not having it clash with anything. Brightling with the yellow, the brick, it looks amazing when yeah. you walk in. I think it makes a great impression. But then you have this very muted, you know, Grand yeah. Seiko, very sleek. Like, how can that all work together? So I think you have to think about it the same way as you're looking at design. You have a clean palette, you have a, the floor just alone, you know, the walls, what are the colors, like just simple ideas like this. How can they all pop in their own way so that it doesn't clash? That was kind of it. I mean, that was really the approach. Very cool. And it works, I think. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I think you said this in one of the videos I watched recently, you're not going to be here all the time. Mm -hmm. How often are you going to be here and how do you then 
keep the experience here for people that want to come by and they want to see Teddy? I mean, I think that is where you have good people. You know, the people that work here, like for example, like a Will who is the first employee here. He, saw, he started as a customer service person. Then if you've watched one of our videos, you've seen his, his work too, because yeah. he was a photographer. He did, shot all the videos before this, and now he's working on the floor. Like this person knows the cycle of our business. John, who's run two different stores in this region, has worked a lot of national players. I mean, these people know watches, but they also know my brand as well as I almost know it. Yeah. So you have to have good people that understand what you're about, and I think that is the first thing, because you can't be everywhere. I mean, that's yeah. the challenge with my business. It's a double-edged sword, because yes, I think people have a personal connection to me, but I can't be there for every single person, and that, and that pains me. So you have yeah. to invest in good people that understand what you want your, want your approach to be. Uh, so that was like, the first thing. And then I, what I want to do is, how can you extend access and also just you know, be able to be there to shake somebody's hand? Yeah. I think you have to have this event cycle and you're kind of more intimate environment, appointment only, where we can just get a group of 30 to 40 people and just have these one-on-ones and have an ability to have these conversations as much as we can. So it's, it's figuring out the scale of it, but it's also figuring out you know, what's feasible too. So you will be having events here for mm -hmm. collectors. Absolutely. That's what I think would be yes. A, yes. a great opportunity. Yes. And so you're from Cleveland originally. I am. Uh, so is that why you chose Cleveland first? And are you thinking about expanding beyond Cleveland? <laughs> it's two weeks in, so I, mean, I, I want to make this one successful first. But we, we chose Cleveland for a variety of reasons. One is we do think that this is an underserved market. And I'm a believer that you don't invest in anything that you don't know. And there's one thing I do know outside of watches, and that is this market. I mean, I know what could work here. I know the people here. I know what's missing, at least what I feel is missing. So I wanted to start in a place where I had that confidence. The other aspect was this, this center in Crocker Park. It's a phenomenal shopping center where yeah. you know, you're seeing you know, here on a Sunday, just the foot traffic coming yeah. by. Like, I, I just thought that was a really good draw. And then Cleveland, in terms of where it's located, I think is also great because we are a two hour drive from Detroit. We're a two hour drive from Columbus, two hour drive from Pittsburgh. Then you have Cincinnati three to four hours away. Then you have Chicago five hours away. So you have access to you know, 30 million people within a five hour drive of you. And a lot of these people don't have access to a brand like a Grand Seiko. Like we're the only retailer outside of Cincinnati, which is a four hour drive away to even see this brand. There's been people that come in this store and like, Grand Seiko's here. Yeah. And like, that's something that if you go into Manhattan, it's like, oh, yeah. Grand Seiko again. <laughs> oh, there it is again. Yeah. You know, so this is yeah. a cool aspect of it. We also have our team here. I mean, we have over 20 people that you know, work in Cleveland. So we have this company that's based here, that makes it easy as well, and being able to take that leap. And it allows us to learn a lot, you know, to just see what goes forward. Because if you can win in a market like Cleveland, I think it opens up where you can really think about where you can scale uh, from here. So are there any brands that people have come in and really asked for that you don't carry, that you now are now thinking about carrying? Well, I mean, the, the thing that comes in all the time, this is every retail in the country, yeah, Rolex, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but that's, you know, that's besides the point. Uh, yes, I mean, ab absolutely. But this is also why this space over here is very important, mm -hmm. where you can extend what you're doing with e-commerce and have this appointment type setting. Uh, but it's been great. And you see the appetite for not only these brands, but yeah. like, hey, what, what's next? What's next? I'm looking forward well, what, to it. What brand would you want? If you could, any brand that you don't carry oh. right now, what I don't would know be if, next? I don't know if there would be one. If I do another store, it would it'd be a similar environment. I'd think mm -hmm. of like a cohort of three to four yeah. or something like this. And then also I'd want to you know, figure out how do we extend the e-commerce presence? So I don't know, because one wouldn't get it done, right? <laughs> yeah, like one yeah. would not change anything. I think we have to you know, scale it out a little bit more. And because I don't think, there's not really room to No, this place build. is maxed out. This place is maxed out. You gotta out. take over the lease next door. <laughs> Whatever we need to do, yes. <laughs> you know, now that you have this space, are you gonna be doing more like filming and incorporate it more into your, you know, your platform, doing stuff from the store? I think so. I mean, I do want to keep the personal touch of what our brand is, though. Mm -hmm. I don't want this to become like the place I shoot out of. Because yeah. one, it's not an easy yeah. place to shoot out of or a great place to shoot out of. You have a lot of lights, a lot yeah. of different color temperatures. The audio is probably not the greatest place in the world. But uh, obviously, there's going to be opportunities to shoot here and you know, make it this environment where you know, it could just kind of elevate a little bit. But I also have to think about the ease of just shooting and being able to just you know, sh keep up with the schedule that we have mm -hmm. of posting two, three videos a week on the main channel. Uh, so there's that balance. But I also want to make sure that I don't get too corporate, too. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think this has a certain approach. This is the sales side. Yeah. And the content, to me, is, it's, yes, they're connected, but 
they have some purity to it, and it's a little bit of a different lane. Well, we were talking earlier before we started shooting, and I was talking about how I shoot from my apartment, and you said you still shoot at home. Is that all your content shot at home? Uh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, I have a studio set up at home. I have mm -hmm. a studio set up elsewhere. So it just kind of depends on the day. So if we're trying to get some things out, mm -hmm. absolutely. I've been re watching your YouTube videos for a long time, and I see a lot of questions in the comments. And I wanted to clear up some things and see if you could answer them for me. Sure. So the first one is, you know, I think I've seen your interviews with Kevin O'Leary. Mm -hmm. You've gone watch shopping with him. You know, I see people asking whether he's an investor or who's an investor in Teddy Baldassar. Is he an investor? And if not, or if so, who else is investing in Teddy Baldassar? Right now, there is no investor. I mean, this has all been truly cash flow by my partner, Mike and I. And we've known each other for a long time. And we both have a very similar philosophy to business. Like, I live a pretty chill life. Yeah. You know, I live closer to farms than I do you know, luxury watches. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really you know, need to take that much out of the business. So I have a lot of just retained earnings and we just built this up. And of course there's you know, some line of credit that's involved you know, buying some inventory. But for us right now, I mean, it's important for me to just keep autonomy. So as much as I love Kevin, there's, there's actually no outside investor for the, for the company. So how did you get introduced to Kevin and how did these interviews come about? That came from him coming to town for a speaking engagement. And I saw at the time he was posting about watches. And we saw this kind of opportunity. I was getting hit with these ads. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, you're coming for the speaking engagement. And we just reached out and just asked, hey, Kevin, we saw you're coming to town. We are our watch channel. Talk about watches. So you have some interest in the subject. How would you like to just come on our channel, set up a quick interview. We'll go to the location where you're doing your speaking engagement. And we'll just knock it out. Yeah. He said yes. And it went really well. And then he saw the views. I saw the views. It made sense to keep a relationship going. I think we have a good shtick together. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of more, you know, just mellow and just chill about things. He's got his old Shark yeah, Tank yeah, pitch, yeah. and I, I think it allows us to poke fun at one another. And it's a it's a funny but cool marriage. Very interesting. Um, so I think one of the questions is, you know, people see you on YouTube, but they know you have this, you know, online retail and now, you know, brick and mortar store. How big is the business? You know, how many watches are you selling? How many employees do you have? What can you tell us? So as of right now, we're just shy of around 25 employees full time. Uh, in terms of the business and how it operates, I mean, the majority of how we make money is through selling watches. I mean, YouTube, we get a little bit, but yeah. that operates at a net loss yeah. pretty dramatically. I mean, it, it's not going to be funding our business. So really selling watches, which you know, we're fortunate to you know, sell roughly over 1,000 watches a month at this stage. Uh, so that's really how the business is able to operate. Interesting. So what is the goal? 5,000 watches a month? I don't really think about it. I mean, the, the main thing for me is I want to keep producing this content and how we're able to do that, build a team, build a company. It is through selling watches. So obviously, of course, you'd like to sell more watches because that means, you know, just more yeah. fruits and also you're able to scale things, which that excites me as an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, being able to you know, be on screen, talk about something I like. It's almost just creating a moat around being able to do something you love for a long time. And that's kind of the main thing that drives me. I don't, if I was just going after this for, without any passion, I would have burnt yeah. out a long time ago, honestly. Yeah. And do you see like a direct correlation if you post a video about Tissot, for example, to a spike in you know, sales and maybe Tissot on your website? It all comes down to the product, right? So for us, the content itself, what drives the content is we have a process where it gets approved through each person at the company that's involved with the content, but also even like salespeople with their part of their job. Every single week, they need to pitch five ideas for content. And what we'll do every single Monday morning is we'll go through our content calendar. But in addition to that, we go through all the pitches that people have. Some will get approved, some will not. And really what allows us to get approved more than anything is will the video get engagement? That's number one. Or is there a cool little angle and story that we can tell? Obviously, if there is a cool watch, we sell it. Yes, you can see a yeah. connection. But the views versus what sells, that is not directly correlated. It comes down to views, but also you have to have a product that makes sense. And that's why we always are thinking about what's a product that resonates with audience first and foremost, and can it get work within YouTube? Because if you don't do that and you're just trying to sell product, people feel it. And it's also not going to get engagement. So nobody wins. So do you pay attention to what people are saying in the comments for what they want you to cover? Or, and maybe in the store now, what people come in and ask about? Yes. You just sometimes have to keep in mind that what people say versus how they act are two very different things. <laughs> right? So the comments, you have to make sure that it's not just an isolated incident. It's really people are requesting this. 
And when it makes sense, it makes sense. If it's just some random you know, brand that no one's heard of, like, I mean, that's a tougher hill to climb because yeah. that's, that's the challenge of you know, spending this amount of money on content is you have to really look at it through like, okay, what's gonna get the most engagement? And that's just the, the formula of YouTube and the formula of social yeah. media. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate because there are a lot of things I'd love to do, uh, but you have to find the balance of you know, what do people wanna see as yeah. the first and foremost important thing that you're doing, and then try to you know, balance that out with the story and angle so that it can you know, connect the right way. Yeah, because I, a lot of times what I do is I find a watch that I like, and I'm like, I'll just review this because I like it. How much oh. of that is, <laughs> do you oh, want to do? For sure. Like, as an example, like, it didn't do that well, but I love the watch. It's a Parmigiani uh, Tonda Retropont GMT. Yeah, like, I, that watch is so yeah. sweet. And I, I, you know, it didn't do that well for our channel, but. I just wanted to cover that watch. I had no reason to cover that watch other than the fact that I thought it was a badass piece. And that was it. Yeah, so, I covered that watch. It's a really cool watch. I, I, one of my favorite watches in the past few years, for sure. So there have been a lot of, I guess, watch media websites and blogs that have kind of gone into the retail space. And some successfully and some less successfully. You know, one of the questions I have is, how do you go about this and not become just like an advertising arm of the brands that you're representing and how does that not become the whole identity of Teddy and Teddy Baldassar? Sure. I remember when we first started sitting down, you were asking about how did it evolve to this point because in a niche space like watches, let's be frank, it's hard to make money, it's in content especially. Yeah. You have essentially two routes. You could either go the advertorial route or you could go through the retail route. I decided to go the retail route. You could also just make this a hobby which is fine, but if you're trying to make a living too and you know, really scale the production, and I had an interest in scaling things, you have to make that decision. Yeah. For me, I felt that the best way to go about it was retail. Because for one, we don't do the double dipping. I mean, my interest is through selling watches, but also creating great content. People know if they are in the market for a watch, they know teddybalser.com. It's kind of a meme at this point. All I say is, TeddyBalser.com or an author dealer of over 30 brands, that's just become something people know. Uh, so you just lay out what your interests are, you do the best you possibly can, you try to do things with integrity to the highest degree, but you also have to look at the industry that you're in and trying to make it you know, in the way you can. And, and to me, that was the best route. And I think this question of objectivity, we all have our own challenge of it, right? I mean, for us, you know, we have retail. For others, it might be being gifted a watch. It might be having a friend at a company. Uh, it might also just be getting paid for advertorial content that you are directly getting paid to produce and hit publish on. So we're all trying our best. That's just the way that I try my best. Do you think that you know, some of these blogs going into retail has caused them to lose that and that's why they haven't been as successful in, as you have been in, in their retail operation? So we've been an authorized dealer since 2020, as we talked about. So this is something that we've been finding the balance of for a while. Uh, I, I mean, I think part of it too is just having too many people in the room where you're trying to do too many things for everybody. You're selling advertorial, you have investors. That's difficult. It's difficult to make everybody happy. But when you can operate just based on, as an individual, when I hit to the camera every time, the only person I'm really answering to is myself. And I'm just presenting myself. Also, if I don't do a good job at that, who takes the hit? It's me, my name's on the building. Yeah. So that's the other element of it, I think, which allows us to be a little more successful. There's a personal aspect to it, which I feel more of an obligation to make sure that I'm putting my best step forward, foot, foot forward, and covering things the right way. Because if people don't like our brand, they indirectly, or directly, are not going to like me. And I take a lot of pride in my name. I take a lot of pride in what I've built, and I don't want to throw that away. I don't. So I, I see on the sign it says just Teddy, mm -hmm. but your website's Teddy Baldassar. Uh, first of all, am I pronouncing your last name correctly for anyone that wants to know? That is what I say. Now, it's an Italian origin, so it's actually not the right way to say it. We Americanize it when my great-grandfather came over from Italy, so it's more Baldassare mm -hmm. instead of Baldassar, but I say Baldassar. So that's a whole other story for another day. But you mentioned, yeah, Teddy outside. But the brand is Teddy Baldassar. I mean, everything in terms of our LLC to everything about the company, it's Teddy Baldassar. Teddy, in that framing, I mean, that, that was all our logo when we first launched. And we thought about you know, what's you know, welcoming, but also we did think about how long Baldassar is. It's hard to say. You had to ask me, how do you say it? So all of these were things that we were thinking about as we were trying to you know, make this store. And I want it to be welcoming. What's more welcoming, Teddy 
or Teddy Baldassar. I mean, may, hopefully Teddy Baldassar is a welcoming thing. I did a good job in presenting a very open environment, but it's harder to say, and I could see it being intimidating in some way to come into the store with all these luxury brands, and that's the antithesis of what I want. I want people to come into the store, feel welcome, feel like they can, whether they have the budget for or not, they're looking at a watch or not, they're coming in, just browsing. It's great, I want them to feel at home. And you have, you're like a one name person, like Cher or Madonna at, at this point, yeah, <laughs> at least in the watch I, space. I, that's crazy to think about. That's crazy to think about. I'm very flattered that you say that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's kind of not talk about watches now. What would you do if you weren't, you know, if you didn't have a watch YouTube and, you know, what else would you do? So two things that I'm probably the most passionate about are watches and content. I am not all watches though, so if you wanted to talk with me about other things, there's probably a wide variety of things that I would have potentially gotten into, but content was always an element of interest and it was intersecting with watches, which I think allowed this to all work. But huge sports fan, I mean, I, I watch sports. It's my, re my just release from everything mm -hmm. and you know, I can get out and just kind of dumb my brain down for a moment with a stressful day and just watch it. Love music, um, come from a very musical family. Very interested in that. Do you play anything? I play drums a lot growing up. Uh, don't play as much now, it's a little loud, but you know, I'm, so I'm trying to get a new drum set in, you know, just do no that. No YouTube video of you playing the drums? There's no YouTube video. <laughs> there, there actually might be a high school talent show video out there, but good luck finding that. <laughs> Kudos to anybody. If, if you find one. that, put it, put it in the um, comments and I will uh, pin that comment. It might be taken down by now, so good <laughs> luck. But I probably would be doing something with content, I would, I would still think, um, but watches was just this thing that I was so fascinated with, and it just felt like the right thing to post about at the time. I'm also very into like men's style, fashion, mm -hmm. like heritage clothing, things of that sort. Some of the early videos were not all watch videos. The, I think the second video on this channel was a boot review, right? Is so, it still up? Uh, it might be. It, <laughs> I actually don't know. I mean, some of those early videos, I, I probably just looked at them one day, I was like, uh, do I wanna keep that out? But I, most of my videos are still up, yes, but I'm not sure about that one, but it goes to show, I'm kind of all over the map. I have a lot of different interests. You know, watches is just one element of me, but that's the case for many enthusiasts, right? I mean, watches is like one element to, I think, a, a whole individual. I always say it as well, you know, a great watch does not make a great person. Yeah. You should stay interested in a variety of different things and let these watches be a part of your journey. Let that journey be whatever you're interested in and wherever it takes you. Yeah, and I think we first met in Atlanta at yes. the yes. Uh, Atlanta Braves game. Yes. And you know you were really into into, into yes. it. Um, Sorry if I wasn't talking. I was just into the game. Right? But are there ways you've been thinking about incorporating these other interests that intersect with watches into like your content? How I think about it, the problem is I, I have interests, and I've, as a human, you want to talk about all your interests. Watches is enough to satiate me, mm -hmm. and you also have to think about the people that are watching. If the History Channel starts posting about sports all of a sudden, people are like. What's going on? Yeah. I talked to my cable provider. This isn't what I signed up for and what I'm paying for. People come to me to see watch content. Let's so that's what I want to give them. Well, if you're so one of the questions I have is, you know, I started putting my face out there and doing YouTube rather recently. And before that, I was kind of behind the scenes on wrist enthusiasts. So people didn't really recognize me. But one of the things is on YouTube, people and Reddit and all the other social media sites, people can sometimes be a little bit harsh. And you can get some negative feedback. How do you deal with that? And you know, what is your reaction to you know the memes about you and all of you know all of that entails? Well, some of them are very funny. I mean, let's just be objective about it. I mean, I see some and I, I laugh to myself. But you do have to just see things in an appropriate way and know that you're also fortunate enough to reach a lot of people. And when you're reaching a lot of people, there are going to be a percentage of those people that are not going to like you, which is a weird re like reality because I when interacting with people, I, I do you know, try to set you know, a nice step forward, uh, make sure that I am presenting myself in a good way, but at the end of the day, some people are just not gonna like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to keep that in mind that it's a numbers game, and sometimes they might be correct, right? I mean, not all of them, some of them are just hating, but there's truly honesty and truth behind some of the, the criticism. So I think you always have to keep all of that in mind. I, you look to an extent, but you just look to an extent. <laughs> um, in, you know, in all your videos, you say, I'm Teddy Baldassar, authorized retailer of 30 plus brands, and it's almost become a meme at this point. And like, why do you say that? Is it intentional or? I just said it one day because I remember I was speaking with uh, my business partner and we were just talking about 
hey, like, you know, what, what, makes a, what makes our store unique? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things was just a number, like 30 brand, that's actually a pretty cool shop. And I just would list off some of the things like quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support. So it was just one of the points to make, but it's now has become a little bit of a talk track and I just go into it at the end of every video. Uh, but yeah, so it was just trying to figure out why your store was unique. And I think that is you know, slightly unique if you look at most authorized dealers. Do you think that's helped kind of turn you from just a YouTube content creator to you know, an authorized retailer? Like repeating it and getting people to really understand that? Probably, and then also knowing what authorized is too, because most people that sell watches online are not authorized retailers. Yeah. They are you know, pre-owned sellers, things of this sort. So to go that route, I think was also important yeah. to, you know, to make because authorized means something yeah. rather than you know, selling elsewhere. Not to say that it's bad to buy a pre-owned watch. I think it's great, you can do that. Uh, it's just that it is different. Well, that's one of the things. Most of, I feel, watch bloggers have kind of either gone the advertorial route or sell, you know, flip watches mm -hmm. or sell secondhand. Yeah. You know, going to, as an authorized retailer, seems like a much bigger jump and a lot harder to do. It's just a lot of B2B type of interactions you have to have and conversations you need to have, which if you're not ready to have that, then you're, it's, it's just very demoralizing because if you're going as the entrepreneurial route, and you just want to have autonomy, the most like, ability to just execute without any other conversation to have, Prio makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, but it also doesn't make as much sense in a variety of areas for us just because of the infrastructure you have to have, the photography needs that you have to have, while starting to scale your content production, like how can you make all this work? Because I think about you have authentication, you have to have line of credit and capital available to do it. I would want to personally take photos of almost every single watch yeah. because you want what does the client want? They want to see it. Yep. Thinking about a new watch, it's just not the same amount of investment on that front to keep the operation going in that manner. So it was just the route that we took. I think we considered a lot of routes for monetization, but it was authorized was just the crazy enough thing that we decided to ask about and uh, proceed forward with. So you've had a lot of obvious success with you know, the size of your channel mm -hmm. and also this authorized retail route that you've taken. Have there been any things that weren't as successful that you tried that you can talk about? Yeah, I mean, as an entrepreneur, failure is part of it. Uh, you, you do get a lot of no's in this process, so as much as we succeed in a lot of areas, there's been many failures along the way, but there's also been some larger fa failures. Something, as an example, we talked about pre-owned. You know, pre-owned, yeah. that was something we dabbled in, but it just wasn't as scalable, and it was difficult for us to really get it to a point where it worked with our business model. We had to photograph the watches. We had to yeah. authenticate. You have to have the line of you know, capital and transferring of even funds, like you know, wire transfer, having yeah. the process to do that. Like, that was a whole nother business model while doing Authorize that we, we got going, but we just didn't see the same ability to scale in especially a saturated area. I mean, Authorize is still a you know, saturated yeah. area, but you know, pre-owned for us wasn't just our angle. So we, we shut that down. You know, I didn't for, even know you did that. Exactly, so you know, it was very short-lived, probably six months, but. You learn, you pivot, and you just keep going with what works. Uh, also, I, I started a second channel. I started a second channel with my wife. It was, it was a channel about fragrances. Uh, that was done very similar to watches. I had an interest in it. I know fragrances quite well, but that didn't work either because I couldn't scale my time. And you have to look at the limitations of where your time is. So that was a big learning for me is how can I continue to grow things and extend? And also, we talked about this whole idea of how do you get into different verticals and talk mm -hmm. about different things you're interested in you do also have to keep in mind your time and what you know what's available to you and as you know too you know producing content like it, it's an it investment a it takes a long time you know even editing anything i mean i don't i don't edit the videos but like even going back and forth on an edit revisions mm -hmm. like that's a whole process in itself how much of the process are you actually involved in doing yourself i think our, my subscribers would like to know that I, it's mostly on the front end nowadays, uh, so very involved in any writing or pre-production, you know, for larger shoots. Still, because I'm, you know, be on camera. I have a great group of people that are helping me though in a lot of that. So like, I'll go back and forth, you know, with with scripting, and then I'll, you know, fine tune it to my voice. I'll spend time with the watches, but I mean, some of that is, you know, helping kind of team me up so I can really hit it, hit the ground running. Maybe doing some preliminary research that I can just kind of cross check and make sure it aligns with my own frame of mind and, and what I am aware of. But then there's the uh, post-production process, which is very much involved outside of my hands. So I usually will just upload footage, mm -hmm. and it goes to an editor, and then our uh, video content manager will go back and forth with an editor to get it to the published date. 
most of the videos I record, I actually don't watch myself unless it's a bigger production nowadays. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And early on, were you editing all your own content? Oh yeah. Oh yes. I mean, that, that's what you have to do. Yeah. You have to do it. You have to first build the process. And I think that's important too. Every process in this business at one point, for the most part, I did. Yeah. Right. And that allows you to be a better employer. It allows you to be a better boss. It allows you to be able to figure out like what are the pain points of your business, if there are going to be some snags and bottlenecks. Uh, but yes, video editing did it all, yeah. but I just passed it. That was something I passed off uh, early on because it is just a huge, huge amount of time that you spend. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people recognize like for one video on our channel, so you do the pre-production, you do any scripting if needed. Sometimes you can go directly to camera because you're just maybe doing a listicle or things of that mm -hmm. sort. But many times talking about 20 to 40 hours, just yeah. on a, just on edit, just on yep. the edit. That's somebody's almost full week that they're going back and forth on uh, just yep. to get that done. And you're doing multiple of these a week. Yeah, that doesn't just happen. It's, it's hard. That's why I only get one out a week. <laughs> it's hard. I, hey, yeah. I get it. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. So there are a lot of people that love watches and are collectors that probably want to get started creating watch content. Mm -hmm. And you've been very successful at it. So what advice would you give them for someone either starting a YouTube channel or Instagram or even TikTok? What advice would you give them? Just get started if you have not started yet, because that was the biggest holdup for me was just taking the first step to get it done and throw as much as you can at the wall until you figure out what works for your voice. Mm -hmm. Because in the early days, like as I mentioned, it wasn't all just what you see now. There was a mm -hmm. lot of just stumbling and you have to figure out what your lane is. So there are going to be things that will just crash and burn right away yeah. and it will not work. Figure it out. Figure out what works for you. Figure out what works in the algorithm. Figure out what aligns with your voice and what you want to talk about. And if you can find your lane within a lane, that's the most important thing. Everybody has their own specialty on what their delivery is, what their style is. You have to find your style and find content that is repeatable. That's yeah. the most important thing I actually believe. Because if you just do it one time, that doesn't mean anything in this world of content that's moving at 150 miles per hour every single day. You have to make it repeatable. So that, that would be what I would most likely advice. Yeah, I found that I'm still constantly fine tuning what I'm doing and Same. each time it's just like yeah. a little improvement mm -hmm. and you eventually get to like you're like 80 or 90 percent of what the kind of top production people are doing um, but it just takes a lot you know and every single time is a little bit better than the last. And understand what diminishing returns are mm -hmm. because something that you might notice the audience doesn't notice. Yeah. Right, because like you may have put all this time into this one little aspect of the shot or one little aspect of the edit, nobody cares. Yeah. So you test out whether or not people actually miss where you're putting your effort, because not everything is created equal when it comes to effort. Yeah, some of my best performing content is my earliest content, which you know was much worse produced than sure. I have to say myself. Yes. So it's always interesting to see that. Mm -hmm. You're like, this video is so great. Why didn't it do as well as you know this video where I don't know what I'm doing? High production doesn't always equal views. So I think we've discussed a lot. My kind of final question would be, what's the future of Teddy Baldassar? Where are you going next? What, are you, what do you have planned? As of right now, I'm just taking a deep breath because just to get this store open was a long journey and I want to make it successful. Where it goes from here, I think you just have to keep producing great content. We have to learn what this store is going to do. Is there more scale to this? And what are people's interactions as they come in the store? But right now, we're just basically taking it a day at a time. I do want to just continue to be a leading voice. I feel very fortunate to be able to talk about something I love every single day. So honestly, my main goal, just personally, is to just set up a great life for myself where I can talk about something I'm passionate about because I recognize every single day now, like that is becoming the rare aspect of this business. This is all cool. But the fact that I can do my work and still have interest in it, that's where I have a lot of successful people around me, or at least it appears successful. But you recognize that there's an element that's missing. And what's missing is that they don't have something that still gets them excited. Mm -hmm. Watches still get me excited. Can you show me around the store? Um, we're in Crocker Park, right? Correct. So we're about 25 minutes or so outside of downtown Cleveland. So this is in the western suburbs of Cleveland. We really love this shopping center in Crocker. I mean, it's a place that we grew up kind of going to, and it was certainly missing a watch store, so we're excited to bring it here. This is the only watch store in Crocker Park? Correct. It, honestly, on the whole side of Cleveland. So wow. to get to even another watch store, you're driving 45 plus minutes to an hour. Wow. So mm -hmm. show me around. So starting left, Grand Seiko. 
We're the only retailer in Ohio outside of one other one, but that's four hours away, okay. a pretty big state. Love this brand, collector of this brand. This is so important for me to have in this store. As an enthusiast and a collector, the technology that they have, the collectability, the dials, just the whole imagery around it. I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I know that you also are a big fan of Grand Seiko yeah. as well. So that's front of house on this side. Then flipping over here, Breitling. So this to me might be the most visually eye catching of all of them with the bricks. It's also a little bit different than everything else. Everything else is kind of you know, sleek, very yeah. modern, you know, understated. This is just bold and it will pop out at you all the bricks. Yeah. And we were holding these bricks in our warehouse <laughs> for probably like six months. Yeah. Uh, so that was you know, crazy to see this all get put together. You know, Breitling, it's just such a good draw for people that are coming through. And it's a great brand too when you're talking about just icons, you know, Chronomat, Premier, Navitimer, Super Ocean, Heritage, as well as the more contemporary options. There's just a lot to get lost in. Cool collectability and yeah. Breitling collectors, I mean, they're very, very passionate yeah. about and, this product. You know, it's one of the most recognizable brands. Yes. So it makes sense to kind of be front of house. When I think of, you know, I, you might be a little bit different, but we're, we're based in Cleveland. Some of the yeah. brands I think of, like Breitling is one of the first ones. For people that are not into watches, yeah. it's up there. I'd say top five easily. Yeah, definitely. So I like how this worked out. It was yeah. somewhat with intention. You have Japan, you have Switzerland, and then you have Germany with Glasgow de Riganel. So this to me is one of the gems in watchmaking in general, not even talking about Germany. I love talking about this yeah. brand just because whenever you come in the store, what we've seen, and we've only been open for a couple of weeks, but when somebody comes in, this gets a ton of questions. Yeah. And then you get to see watches like this, like a Panamatic yeah. inverse. You're getting into this price range for those watches and under 15 grand for all of, you know, for many of these watches, unless you're talking about uh, either a higher complication like their 70s chronograph or some of the gold pieces just remarkable yeah. value i mean they're producing 95 percent of their components in glasuta which is a small little town 5,000 people yeah. not much going on outside of watchmaking i mean watchmaking is clearly a hub uh, but this is really where they start to separate where you're in a market here this high horology type of stuff and artisanal finishing usually something you're not going to get this brand is just so cool so what do we have over here i see a lot of different brands so this is what we're calling our Teddy space. Now, what we want to do is have an extension of what we've been doing online for years, teddybaldasar.com. So if somebody, you know, they see this space, you know, you see four key brands, but you know, we sell 30 other brands online yeah. and we don't have room for everything because I didn't also want to get a 20,000 square foot <laughs> yeah. uh, showroom to begin my journey in retail. But we do want to have an ability to showcase a lot of different brands. So our warehouse is right down the street, about you know, five, 10 minute drive. And if you ever are coming to town, you want to look at some watches, this is where we can you know, really dedicate and doing an appointment setting, showcase a variety of different brands uh, and make it curated to what you might see online. So you can have it in this in-store environment where typically you don't see a lot of you know, brands that we sell online in a market like here, or really even a market like anywhere in the United yeah. States. So that's kind of the whole premise of this location where it could be dynamic and allow people to see a variety of different brands. So you can make an appointment yes. and say, hey, I want to see this watch, this watch, and that watch. And when you come, you'll have that moved over from your warehouse. Exactly. That's so I mean, give us about 24 hours, 48 <laughs> hours beforehand, just so we can get everything over. But yes, that's the whole premise. That's great. That seems pretty unique, you know, mm -hmm. to, to you guys. And then back of house, Omega. So this is a space that we also wanted to make more of a hybridized space where you can make it lounge, but also course showcase the watches in yeah. a very you know, upscale way. I mean, Omega, very special brand for me is the first true luxury watch I've ever owned was an Omega. My connection though was mostly with the Constellation family, which is really? usually not the connection most yeah. people have. I mean, I'm wearing an Omega Glowmaster Constellation right now. That to me is a watch that epitomizes a lot of the things that I love about Omega. I mean, it more than meets the eye, tungsten carbide bezel, mm -hmm. you know, master chronometer certified, you know, pursuits of chronometry, you get all that in one package yeah. and a really clean look. I mean, I love the pipe hand dial. Yeah. So, uh, and being an understated piece, I, I like that. Uh, but beautiful back area, you know, couch, chandelier. I always say, you know, keep your head down. If you're you know, below six <laughs> feet, you should be okay. But, you know, still just be alert back there. But this is really the back of house here and a uh, great place to just lounge and, of course, talk watches too. Yeah. And Speedmaster, I, that's, sure. where I, that's where I land with Omegas, being a big kind of space nerd, first watch on the moon. You um, along with many others. <laughs> many others, yeah. <laughs> right. And one other thing. Before we you know, talk about other, the rest of the space, I think another important thing to talk about is the people in the store. So we have John, we have Will here. They've been with the company for a long time. They know a thing or two about retail. They're watch guys. 
for myself, because I can't be here all the time, I will definitely stop in, but it's important for us to be able to have the approach that we have with all of our content and just being down to earth. We're, we're all from this area, we know it well, we love watches. That's the most important thing. And these guys are pros, they know what they're doing, and uh, they love to talk, maybe, maybe a little bit too much, honestly. <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time just chatting it up in here, and I you know every single day it feels like we've been open after close and uh, just being able to talk about this. Well, great, nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you as well. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me stop by and see the amazing store. It's, it's been great. Thank um, you. I will post links in, you know, in the caption to how they can visit the store and how they can visit your website and also links to my website, riskenthusiast.com and you know, if you want to stay up to date on any watch news and everything. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming, Craig. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for stopping in. Please do stop in uh, next time. And next time I'm in Cleveland, maybe. I'm definitely coming back. Please do.